If you're studying for the INBDE, I highly recommend INBDE Bootcamp, an all-in-one study resource that will help you pass your exam. Use coupon code MENTALDENTAL for 10% off. Hey everyone, Dr. Ryan here, and welcome back to our biostatistics series. In this video, I'm going to be talking to you about sampling and allocation. Most clinical research involves human subjects, so in this video we're going to focus on how we select and utilize human subjects to provide meaningful data that ultimately improves our knowledge about the prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of diseases and other health conditions. So for some simple definitions, the word population refers to the set of all individuals that you want to study. So your target population might be really broad, like adults, or every person in the United States. Or it could be more specific, like adults aged 30 to 50 years old with moderate to severe periodontitis living in urban areas. Or dental students at the UNC Adams School of Dentistry. It could even be as specific as a certain tooth that we're interested in. Maybe first molars in teenagers, or incisors in elderly patients, or canines in patients with a malocclusion. The target population is the specific group of individuals or teeth that researchers aim to study. This population is defined by certain characteristics that make it relevant to the research question or hypothesis. We have a potential problem, though. It may not be possible and usually it's not possible, to gather data from every single person in this target population. And that's where a sample comes in. So a sample is a set of representative individuals, or their measurements, selected from the population of interest. So these people are chosen and set apart from the rest of the target population. The question is, how do we choose a representative sample? So the process of sampling explains how individuals are selected from a population to be included in a study sample. And there are several ways this can be done. One option is a census, where the entire population is sampled. Let's say, your inclusion criteria for the study, which means the criteria for being included in the study, is fully edentulous elderly patients in the U.S. So if you had a way to contact every single elderly patient in the U.S., find all of the ones who are fully edentulous, and involve every single one of them in that study, that would be considered a full census. Now, it sounds great in theory, but not very plausible. And so that's where the other selection methods come in. Random selection involves a probability sample. So this requires a list of all of the population members, but then you randomly select from that list. So let's go back to our edentulous example. The researcher could compile a list of all of these people and then assign each elderly edentulous patient a number, and then use a random number generator to select, let's say, 100 of them to participate in the study. By choosing a sample from the larger population in such a way that every individual in the population has an equal chance of being selected, that sample is considered a probability sample and would hopefully be very representative of the entire population. But sometimes a random sample is not possible either, and so we go to the last category here, the non-random selection. And we have several options for this category. A consecutive sample is where you include all individuals after a specific time or date. For example, all patients who walk through the door of your practice on Monday. Those are the people who will be included in the study. 
or you go to a continuing education course and the first 10 people to walk through that door get this survey that you're using for your research. This would be considered the best of the non-random options. A convenience sample is where the study population is chosen from a group that is easy or convenient to reach or access. For example, people who you happen to meet at a dental convention or students that happen to be in the classroom that day. You ask them to be involved in the study because it's easy. Now this one's not quite as strong as the consecutive sample, and certainly neither of these are as strong as a probability sample. Lastly, we have the judgmental sample. This is where you have purposeful selection of individuals by the investigator. For example, you might intentionally select easy to work with people or patients who demonstrate the best compliance with wearing clear aligners. This is the worst of the non-random because there's a lot of bias in your selection of subjects. And that sample will be least representative of the entire target population you're trying to investigate and draw conclusions about. There are also other forms of non-random sampling, like voluntary response sampling, where volunteers who agree to participate in a study are included in that study, and snowball sampling, where an initial subject is sampled, who then recommends another subject who meets the study criteria, and that person recommends another subject, and so on. Next is allocation. Allocation is how individuals are assigned to different groups, either treatment groups, control group, placebo group, and so on. So we have a couple options for this as well. Natural assignment means that the group allocation is based on characteristics not under investigator control, like health status, disease diagnosis, age, etc. Natural characteristics are what are responsible for allocating people into different groups. Random assignment has two main options. Simple randomization means that individuals are assigned to groups using a chance device, once again, like a random number generator. For this example depicted here, each of these people in the sample has a one-third chance of being allocated to one of these three possible treatment groups, A, B, or C. It's a fair, completely random chance. Stratified randomization is basically simple randomization with one extra step. It's conducted within a homogeneous group, which could be a certain age bracket or disease severity. For example, you could first take all of the males and then randomize them into groups A, B, and C using a random number generator. And then you could take all the females who were sampled and then randomize them into groups A, B, and C. And finally, we have non-random assignment, which is, again, not as strong as a random allocation method. Group assignment here would be based on convenience or clinician choice or popularity. Once again, the worst method on the list. So what I think really helps with biostatistics and understanding these concepts is giving you a concrete example. So let's consider a dental study designed to compare the effectiveness of two types of fluoride treatments on preventing dental caries. So let's say researchers decide to study a group of school-aged children in a city. They use random sampling to select 200 children from the city's school system to participate in the study. This ensures that the sample is representative of the broader population of school-aged children in that city. Let's say there's 100,000 school-aged children in the city being studied. And so after the 200 children have been randomly sampled, researchers use random allocation to assign them to two groups. A hundred children receive treatment A, a fluoride rinse, 
and 100 children receive treatment B of fluoride varnish. This step ensures that each child has an equal chance of being assigned to either treatment group, minimizing bias and possible confounding variables. We'll talk more about research bias in the next video. So in summary, sampling is about selecting participants from a population to be in the study. And allocation is assigning those selected participants to different groups within the study. Both steps are crucial in a research design, but they serve different purposes and occur at different stages in the research process. That's it for this video lecture. Thank you so much for watching. I genuinely appreciate it. I'd also really appreciate if you consider clicking that like button below this video, subscribing to the channel if you have not already, sharing this video with your friends, and leaving a comment below letting me know what you thought. All of those things can really help to grow the channel. If you want to go above and beyond supporting me and what I do here, please check out the Patreon page linked below. If you want to join there, you'll get access to exclusive practice questions, exclusive study guides, a Discord server, and so, so much more. And if you see at the end of my videos, I have an end credits screen, and all of those names there are the names of my amazing Patreon supporters that I'm honored to have. Thank you again for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.